Good morning. Um, it's good to be here. Thank you very much for attending this webinar this morning. Um, I am just very gently starting to introduce ourselves and to introduce the morning. Um, usually we do say that we start sort of a little bit later, but obviously that's that's also um, not 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 always pleasant if, if we already have um, a bunch of people in the room to then wait five minutes. Um, so I'm just very gently starting to introduce and to welcome you all. Um, it's great to, to have that many people registered on the call and um, to see that the book is such, um, you know, it's basically such, such an important book for so many people already. Um, it's great to have um, some names on the, on the call that I recognize as well. So for those of you that know me personally, um, thank you very much for the support that you, you have given me and you continue to give me through this um, book as well, through the book launch. Um, how this is going to play out today is we are, I'm going to start introducing everybody very, very quickly. And then we have different talks um, from, from authors, contributors um, to the book. Um, and we will be then opening up for questions. Um, and there is an opportunity to, for you to use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen to post any kind of questions. Um, it would be great to, to, if you could just like put the, the questions there. Um, and um, we have got some support from Bristol University Press um, Policy Press um, and Millie is, is helping us in the background. So, so do do please um, get get in touch with us over the chat box and um, through the question and answer box at the bottom of the, your screen. So to start us off, um, I would like to very again say a, a, a very very heart, warm welcome um, to this book launch of the book that's called Lift Experiences of Ableism in Academia: Strategies for Inclusion um, in Higher Education. Now, I have got. Um, with me today, um, four speakers. Um, for some reason at the moment, Jo is on the call, but she seems to be on the call as a, as a webinar person rather than as a panelist. So I'm hoping that we can sort the, the technical glitch here and, and she'll be able to join us um, as, a, as a person, as a panelist in, in you know, any minute. Um, just to say to the people that are here that you can see there is Ben Lum, um, who's a composer, and he's going to be talking about his chapter um, about um, ableism in, in music academicism. Um, and then we've also got um, Jennifer Lee, who is here um, from the University of Kent, and um, Jen will be talking about her chapter um, about more, not so much about, um, you know, the, an, an, a particular experience of disability, but actually about how we can use specific ways of looking um, at it, uh, disabled experiences to kind of help us with knowledge generation um, in that sense. So Jen's um, chapter sits within the book at the beginning um, against um, two other chapters where we have um, the idea of, you know, generation of knowledge and, and what kind of lens do we use to actually explore our experiences. And we have got here Joe, who is now called Nicole Brown. So I do apologize um, for that, but that's because she's using my link now. Um, so Joe is, thank you very much for Millie, I assume, who's, who's changed the name there. Um, so Joe is um, our other speaker who is going to be talking about her chapter. Um, I've always just wanted to be a nurse. Um, and then we've also got Emma Shepherd with us. Um, unfortunately, she's not um, actually able to be with us today. Um, she emailed me late last night to say that she's got an emergency and she's got an appointment this morning. So she can't make it um, in person, but she has sent through um, a video that I'm able to share with you um, from her talk. So just very briefly, I would like to introduce the book um, as to how it came about. And I've got to say, I'm incredibly proud of that particular book. Um, some of you will know that there is an, an, another edited book that came out through UCL Press, which was called Ableism in Academia. And that was more to do with the theorization of, of disabled experiences. And this one is really about the lift experiences and about the practical strategies and, and, and about you know, yeah, something more tangible, um, more practical. And, and for me, 
it was always important to have those two books together. I never saw them as two separate books. I actually saw them as two sides of the same coin. In my own understanding of, of how research and practice works, um, the research can't exist without the practice and the practice can't exist without the theorization and the research. And that is why for me, the two books are, are essentially two volumes on the same topic. It just so happens that they've been put together as two separate books um, with two different publishing companies. But actually, um, it's incredibly powerful to have the, the, the two books together and to, to, in a way, work alongside each other. What makes this one, the lived experiences of ableism and academia, um, that little bit sort of more impactful on, on a personal level for me, and why I'm, I'm, I'm even prouder of this one, if I can be at all, um, but why I'm even prouder of this one than, than of the other one is because of the honesty and, and, and the truthfulness of people's contributions. So not only have there, are there like some 18 chapters that are incredibly powerful in terms of um, exploring lived experiences, they all come from people's personal experiences and they all link to personal um, life stories. And, and that is the element that's, that I found particularly fascinating. In many ways, we could say that all of the contributors to this book have made themselves vulnerable. Um, every single one of them has been talking about what it feels like to have either a chronic condition or a disability or some mental health issues, whatever it is. That is really something that you know makes obviously within academia makes does make people stand out. Um, it others them, it stigmatizes them. But at the same time, they're not using that um, to tell us off or to, to whinge or to moan. It is about demonstrating actually this is what it feels like but this is what we can do about it this is what we can do to help people like me this is what we do um, to support people you know either members of staff or students to get a more inclusive environment in higher education and that practical element that coming out from the personal experiences using scholarship to make sense of those experiences that is the part that's really, really fascinating. And, and that, that's the part that I'm particularly proud of. One of the things that I would like to say, if anyone um, has picked up or not quite picked up the book yet, there are some topics in the book that are not easy to digest. Um, some of them are sort of, you know, written in a way that make light of some of the experiences and they, they use humor and they use irony and sarcasm. And it's really easy to kind of, you know, relate to those stories, but at the same time, not feel personally affected too much in the sense that you don't, you don't get this feeling of, um, I'm re I really can't take this anymore. However, there are some topics that are being discussed that do do that. And again, this is the, the, the great value and, and the great achievement of this book, but also of, of each individual, um, how they have been writing about their experiences. So I'm incredibly proud, incredibly appreciative and, and totally humbled by how powerful these um, discourses are. And, and to be honest, I was at one point um, as those chapters came in, there was at one point, a, one particular chapter, and I'm not going to tell you which one, but, <laughs> but there was one particular chapter that made me cry um, as I was reading it. And I had goosebumps and I was physically exhausted from just reading at the beauty of it. And, and honestly, it's, it's a great pleasure and a great privilege to have been able to put this book together. So um, I, I'm quite aware that I've been sort of rambling a little bit, but at the same time, I just want to get across as to how proud and appreciative I really am. And it, this book would not have come together without the contributions of all of those people that have been involved in it. So again, to anyone who's contributed, thank you very much. To anyone who's going to pick it up to read, please do, and do read it with the eye of, well, what does it feel like to be disabled in academia, but also with, okay, what, so what does that mean? What can I personally do about that? How can I make a difference? Because it's that element that came out throughout all of the chapters that was incredibly important. The kind of understanding that there is an empathy required, that we do need an attitudinal change. 
And actually, how the chapters are organized is quite helpful as well, because at the end, there are um, reflective questions and recommendations for practice. So do please engage with those elements. They were not written um, just for the sake of, of having some, some features there. They were written with that in mind that actually that, that book is helping people's attitudes to change and transform. So with that, I would like to stop and I'm going to hand over um, to our first speaker today, that is Jennifer Lee. Um, Jennifer is um, a senior lecturer at the um, University of Kent, Centre for Studies in Higher Education. Um, um, Jennifer also happens to be my former supervisor in PhD on, on my own PhD, so I have known Jen for quite a long time now. Um, and the um, original conference that happened in 2018, upon which this book is loosely based. Um, Jen was also helping um, organize at the time. Um, she has also co-edited with me the Ableism in Academia book. She has um, co-authored with me as another book, which is um, Embodied Inquiry, which is recently coming out as well. And she's currently working on a book um, that's working on the boundary between arts and research and therapy. Um, and she's talking today about her chapter, um, Authenticity and Embodiment um, in Higher Education and in Disabled Experiences. So, Jen. You're on mute. <laughs> You're on mute. I can't unmute you. <laughs> Thank you for the prompt. I, I, I thought I'd get the share screen sorted out in advance and then obviously the Zoom disappeared and I couldn't find the unmute button. Um, so yeah, okay, let's try again. Um, please bear with me. I've been up since 4.30 and I have the mother of all migraines. Um, so I'm probably <laughs> not firing on all cylinders. Okay, I'm going to try again. Sharing screen two. And I'll talk this through. Okay, hopefully you'll be able to see this. I can't see any of you, so I'm just going to assume that unless I hear you, Nicole, that um, that everything is good and you can see what I am sharing. Okay, so embodiment and authenticity. And I've already started, I suppose, by trying to be authentic in how I'm feeling today in terms of getting up early and um, and having a migraine, which does affect how, how my brain thinks and how I can process information, but also how I can sense information from my body. Um, the content for this chapter started life actually as a keynote back in 2018, where I was asked to talk to a group of sports researchers about embodiment and what embodiment can bring to the idea of sport research. This wasn't actually a completely uh, a huge step to then look at ableism, disability, chronic illness and neurodivergence because my own training in embodiment came as being a yoga teacher and a somatic movement therapist. So back when I was working, embodiment to me was something that you had as a process, so something that you work towards to becoming more embodied, but also something that you could see in other people, so it was a state of being. And when I was working as a yoga teacher, not only by witnessing other people's bodies could I necessarily see whether they had illness or injury or a restriction in movement, but also whether they took part in, an, act, in a, an embodied practice. So something like yoga or martial arts or running or a gym, you could tell, I could tell from how somebody moved, what kind of practice that they had, if they had one. But also in terms of yoga, because that was my speciality, I could probably tell you very accurately, if you did yoga, what kind of yoga you practiced. And, that kind of level of awareness of someone's embodiment was there just, just because I was using it so much. Probably not quite so good these days because although I practice yoga, I don't teach it anymore. I think it's really helpful to start, if I can actually move on to the next slide, that would be helpful, by thinking about what embodiment means and what I mean by embodiment. Embodiment is a contested concept. It's an idea that is used by many people to mean slightly different things, slightly like disability. Um, 
embodiment is something that it, the dictionary definition is very much it's like a tangible or visible feeling of an idea a quality or a feeling and in academic terms it is used in by sociologists to talk about how we present ourselves the clothes that we wear the body language that we use or how we might portray our identity things like being tattooed or pierced or or wearing a uniform for example to show that we belong to a particular group other soci soci sociologists would say that where I talked already about embodied practices like yoga, that all practices are embodied because we all have meaty, breathy, fleshy bodies that move around the world and that we're part of those. And although this is a step on from Descartes' duality, the split between mind and body, it can still be used to be very objective about the body, to talking about the body, my body, rather than the fact that you are your body and they're one and the same thing. When we look at philosophical understandings of embodiment, people like Merleau-Ponty were, were incredibly passionate about the fact that we use our body to process the world around us. And that is how we negotiate the world and how we see it and how, we, um, and how our, embodied, our embodied self is how we interact with the world. Um, I wonder sometimes though, whether philosophers such as him actually use their bodies very much or whether they were more very sitting and thinking and caught up in their heads rather than using their bodies in the world so much. Drew Leder is another philosopher who says that our bodies are absent unless they are not working properly, unless they're in pain or have illness or disease. And by that extent, you can imagine that someone with a disability, a chronic illness or a neurodivergence, they have their body become incredibly present to them and make it very aware. And I think there is a lot of truth in that. I have a wrist injury for the last two weeks and I'm incredibly aware of my wrist when I'm sitting, when I'm writing, when I'm typing. As I've said already, my head is not working and that fuzziness or so that brain fog also extends to my body and how I can perceive and become aware of that. My own understanding of embodiment is that it is, as I've already said, a both a process as well as a state of being and it is in a conscious self-awareness of the thoughts and the images and the feelings and the emotions and the proprioceptive awareness that is where we are in space that arise from both our body and our mind and it's something that we can learn to do and we can we can teach someone how to be embodied and and this is something that we can practice throughout our lives this what I describe as embodiment is not necessarily the same for all people. Maxine Sheets Johnston, who is a philosopher and a dancer, would say that I'm not talking about embodiment at all. I'm talking about kinesthetic proprioception. And technically, I agree with her there as well. However, I purposefully choose to use the word embodiment because it means something to many people, whether that meaning or that definition is slightly the same or slightly different. I believe... Um, just like Johan here, that movement is the, the bond between the mind and the body. It's the, the bridge between how we sense things and then how we make sense of things. And as such, it's incredibly inclusive because we all move. We don't have to be a professional athlete or a dancer in order to move. We move when we sit, when we stand, those small adjustments of weight, when we fiddle. I'm trying to fiddle out of sight of the camera so that it's not disturbing. And I'm, I'm very aware that the panelists have been asked to leave their cameras on whilst others are talking. And the knowledge that I'm gonna try not to fidget, I will, I'm gonna try very hard not to pick my nose. But this idea that we're moving all the time is very inclusive because beyond those gross physical movements, there's also the internal ones. We're breathing, our lungs and our ribs move as we breathe in and breathe out and our very cells move as they too respire. If I was here with you in person then what I would do now is to invite you just to take a moment to shut your eyes and to notice your body and to notice your movement, to feel the pattern of breath that it's making in your body as you breathe in and you breathe out, to notice your state of mind, to notice how you're sitting or standing or lying without judging or without changing and then if you're uncomfortable and if you need to move to find comfort allowing yourself to move. It's kind of hard to do that, particularly when I can't see anybody at all. But I do invite you, as I do in the book, just to pause and to take a moment to notice where you are, because that to me is the first step towards becoming more embodied or to becoming aware of your own embodiment. In the chapter, I talk about embodiment as a way to generate knowledge. 
And I think this is a really interesting concept about how we can use this idea of embodiment in order to research and to capture and to generate data and knowledge, as well as to analyze and to disseminate that data. It's the kind of work and a kind of approach that works incredibly well in combination with creative and arts-based approaches. And what you can see here is a collage that I drew or created in response to a question around ableism in academia in a workshop that Nicole led. Oh, I think it was back in either 2018 or early 2019. For those of you who can see the image, it is a, a mishmash of different textures and colours with broad yellow sweeps with a repetition in terms of stickers that are, are curved to have volume, but also a dark swell of black and red. And you can see, I hope, in or imagine the emotions that lie behind this whole idea and this topic. Similarly, Creative and embodied approaches can be really useful for allowing us to express things that are hard to put into words. So whether that is something that's really personal or emotional, maybe distressing, or whether it's something that uh, a concept that's quite esoteric and hard to explain or to put succinctly. So this second collage is an image created in response to the prompt of who are you as a researcher? And again, you'll see there's an awful lot of texture. There's a recognizable figure, but also elements of fire or nature and a movement towards a black sphere. I'm obviously not that enthralled or necessarily 100% positive about my journey through academia, as you can see. And I think this comes to something that I'll talk about later. And Nicole spoke about in her introduction about the vulnerability that there is in using these kind of research techniques and, and to disseminate this kind of data, because it puts you very much on the line, allowing people to see deeper inside you than you might necessarily choose to do. I have here a, a video of which demonstrates what embodied research might look like. I'm going to attempt to play a little bit of it um, just to give you an idea of what it can look like to use an embodied perspective in research. And this came from a study that I started back in 2016 or 2017, which was looking at embodied academic identity. So I'm going to try and play this from just a few seconds. So, I guess, you know, the bottom line is authenticity, even though it's a very strange and misunderstood word. I want to be authentic in the world that I'm in. I feel that the, the, my embodied practice is very strongly related to the desire to take it into a space where it, it is actually a communal practice. I've always been much more of an embodied person than I ever was when I started becoming an academic. I used to love being in nature and dancing, fighting, climbing. The second part of the video shows how I used authentic movement, which is a particular ritualized form of dance and therapeutic process work in, a, in, in the same research project. We talk about this in the book Embodied Inquiry about how this has different um, aspects and ways to, to think and conceptualize knowledge that might arise from an embodied inquiry. In authentic movement, you move from those unconscious felt impulses. There's a witness, you can just see her at the bottom right side of the frame. And after an agreed time of movement, the mover will talk about her experiences and then the witness will respond in an unjudgmental and an uncritical way. Embodiment can also be used um, to elicit information and, and as part of an interview process. And here you'll see a, 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 a mark making, a drawing that was created during an interview around well-being and different aspects of well-being. And you can see from the swirls on the page that this was a very animated discussion with elements being brought in as they were thought of and how they contributed and took away from that individual's experience of well-being and how things like practice and institutionalized well-being initiatives fed in or took away from that their experience. Final thing that I want to talk about is what does it mean to be authentic? And as I've said, and as Nicole said, I think a large part of authenticity is around allowing yourself to be vulnerable, but doing this in a very self-conscious and reflexive way. It's very akin to this idea of positionality and reflexivity that is common within ethnographic research, but it goes beyond that because it allows us to identify and to be very, um, very, very reflective and very aware of who we are and what is the impact on us. 
it's an element of research that can be applied to not only data capture, data gathering, as you've already seen, but in the analysis and the dissemination parts as, as well. How do I respond to this data that I have collected or the data that I have gathered? How does this make me feel? How do I want my audience or my readers to feel when they respond to it, when they read it, when they find out about it and when they engage with it? When it comes to things like disability and chronic illness and neurodivergence, I think it's absolutely imperative that the researchers are authentic and clear about who they are and their own relationship to that work. That doesn't mean they have to disclose everything as in as many of the authors do in this book, but it means that they have to be aware of their own relationship to it and how that then impacts on the questions they ask on the ways they go about researching into it and how they present that information because I think we're all aware that research isn't objective it's not something we can do in isolation we can't separate ourselves from it in the way that, that the positivistic way that many scientists once believed they that that could happen some still do believe that I do quite a lot of work with scientists and they would like to think everything's objective but I don't necessarily agree so this is just a, a quick plug for the Nicole and my um for our new book on embodied inquiry and research methods and we talk around ableism we talk about chronic illness and neurodivergence as something that can be explored through using this method just as just as um it can be used to um use to explore other methods as well i'm going to stop sharing there and hope that made sense Please bear with me and forgive me for my migraine fuddled brain, but I'd be absolutely fascinated to hear any questions and to discuss and obviously to see what everybody else um, speaks to about their chapters of this really important book. Thank you very much, Jen. Thank you very much. Um, so what I thought we could be doing, if, if that's OK with everybody, um, is that we are um, sort of holding off on, on questions um, on individual presentations and try and have more of a conversation later on together, all, all of us together. Um, um, there's one comment I'm saying that is brilliant and inspiring. Thank you very much. Um, so hard to present with a migraine. I empathize. So you've got some really good supporting um, comments here thank you very much i do have actually a couple of questions i would like to ask you um but i'm i'm, I'm holding off for now and i will come back to that later um in in view of of um emma not being here um we are making a little bit of a jump in the book um emma's chapter would be chapter 11 ben's chapter 14 um so we, we're moving into into the um, sort of se second half of the book um before we move back forward a little bit again um ben is going to be presenting on his chapter where he's talking about um ableism in in music and Ben Ben is a composer and associate art artist for the Drake Music and Drake Music School um, Scotland. Um, ben studied at the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama under the guidance of Peter Reynolds. Um, and we have been um, really, really privileged to hear Ben's contribution upon which his chapter is based um, in March 2018 in, in our conference um, at UCL Institute of Education. Unfortunately, back then, Ben was not able to attend, so he was one of the very few people who was attending remotely, and at the time that was pretty unique. I do appreciate that now with COVID pandemic and all of that, it's not that unique anymore, but it was actually pretty unique and quite original and something very special on the day too. So Ben, with no further ado, handing over to you. Thank you very much, Nicole. And firstly, it's absolutely wonderful to see myself alongside everyone else within this book. And it's been really wonderful to see all the other different chapters and all the various different contributions and so on. And it's wonderful to have you all here today as well as to hear me waffle about my own little chapter within this. And it's just a lovely novelty for the first time to appear in a book myself. So it's all just very lovely for us. And I'm very, very happy about it all. So within my chapter, I look at music academicism so this could either be like musicology or sort of performances and performance theory and all these various other different elements that come inside it but the main thing when we talk about barriers that exist we have to sort of make sure that we're not only addressing things like say relation to discrimination problems within say the building and various other different issues which come within ableism but also just in the nature of how the beast of the subject works so for the arts in general what separates them 
in comparison to say other fields of study say like the sciences and so on it is always a much more responsive of to the the creator and then the created item and so then you're in a position where the topics of your discussion tend to focus around the creator and then the resulting created item which then means that the academic world is always a reflection of who made it what they did how they did it and all these various other different elements which then means that any sort of academia that come, is born out of it is then born of the world that is producing that which then means ultimately if the professional world for the arts isn't accessible is doesn't have many disabled people in it it then means the ability to talk about disabled people becomes significantly harder simply because the subject matter of study isn't necessarily there and so that means the way in which we address these problems has to shift very very differently to accommodate this matter and so within my chapter I sort of highlight sort of four key problems and they're all sort of feed into each other and all sort of based on this particular idea of fix that dynamic to then help build it and identify it from there. So the first one is the lack of representation, which as I mentioned, just quite simply, if there aren't disabled people making music, it's then very hard to talk about disabled people making music when the reality is there are very much, but the problem is because of discrimination because of lack of understanding and various other different elements it then means that for a lot of people if they don't know disabled people are making music why bother talking about it because they're not there whereas with say the particular resurgence we've seen around say discussing um black and other ethnic minority composers within britain or across the world across the board it's managed to rebuild because there's been that push and that constant effort to then build it up that way. So then it's at a point where you have to then discuss that, oh yes, they are there, there is this history and so on. And in a very similar manner into the way we're discussing female composers, there's this very same kind of problem in the sense of it had to build and build and build and for enough effort from academics to really bring that to the fore to then make it a much more normal academic field. Whereas for disability, we're sadly in a much more infant situation in comparison. Another sort of particular unique issue we tend to find within uh, musicology and just with academicism in our world is that the very famous people who did become disabled or who were disabled at some point aren't discussed as disabled. So as an example, Gustav Holst, the wonderful composer of the planets, one of the most popular pieces of music that has ever performed in Britain and around the globe. He is a man who was too disabled to play the violin, so his father taught him, got him lessons for the trombone instead. So he didn't follow in his father's step, but then went for an instrument that was much more accessible to him. This then ultimately then meant that the music he grew up with, the sort of environments he worked with, meant, say, working with wind and brass and so on, was much more natural to him instead of, say, strings. And no one discusses that as a disability. No one discusses that it was something he was a disabled man in any real way. They talk more about, oh, he was very, very English or he was very, very socialist. But no one really talks about that he was a disabled man. Then similarly with Beethoven or with other composers sort of even earlier, the discussion is almost like either it's a tragic story that then stops them getting or makes their struggle even more heroic because they managed to produce art despite losing their eyesight, despite losing their ears and all this various other nonsense. But actually, they became disabled. That was simply it. But it's always discussed as a byproduct almost, or if they are actually just growing old and not actually a disabled thing, which then means we're in this weird situation where we have plenty of people we could talk about as disabled people, but then aren't. Or there are people who are disabled who because they're disabled aren't able to necessarily get to the same levels of fame and so on and then getting the support so we have this double-edged sword happening at the same time which then means finding that representation for disabled people is really really very hard and this then as both of the representation and historic figures all feeds together it's very very difficult to really really address that as a further side as well when we're looking at representation and the discussion of the real world as well currently in 2018 the, the 20 the arts council do their portfolio organizations which then shows the bodies that are getting a nice amount of funding to allow them for three four years to be able to work do lots of various different projects and so on and as part of this they then 
have give out the data to make sure because as many organizations they are accountable to the public and they need to show how they're spending the money and all this various other different stuff and the statistics will show that within 828 organizations that got funding across all the arts including museums and archive work and so on in all those sectors only 35 um this yeah there are only 35 disabled group or groups that had disabled people within it and with only two of them being disabled led organizations which sort of highlights the problem even deeper so we're at a position where we're not even to a percentage of all those organizations that are disabled so it's understandable from that sheer point alone that of course discussing disabled people is going to be difficult because they're not getting the support they're not existing and or, or at least not getting the support to exist in the real world around them um then as i mentioned the second segment i talk about historical figures and the questions of how to address this as well is quite an interesting one because particularly when as i've just sort of spotted in the chat coming up discussions of decolonization and all the space of different instances i make reference to uh some writing by kim jong-il is quite an interesting one as he talks about how to address the colonial impact of japan within Korea in the whole peninsula and sort of trying to find a way that can make music that is purely Korean and doesn't have that imperialist Japanese influence and the problem you're sort of finding is if you don't necessarily have that character you're then not able to make it that way and it shows the complicated contradiction of history in the sense of all parts of it feed together and it's very hard to sort of escape out of it which then means for us we're in this weird situation where when we're looking at sort of historical figures we do have to make sure that when we're discussing disability, we understand the role disability played in society at that time. Our understanding of disability has changed. Technically speaking, if we're looking at say early 20th century, do we count the vast majority of the LGBT community because they were considered a mental illness? Or do we actually, how do, and it's all these sort of questions that make it significantly more difficult. And then also just in the, the allusions to how people talk about disability and so on. Um, so for example, disability is mentioned hundreds and hundreds of times within the Bible, but the, the word disabled is never used. It's usually the lame, the cripple, the psychotic, or just the possessed in all these various other different instances, which then means when we're just talking about music, we have to make sure that it's matching that kind of problem because it's constantly evolving. And as we know, with like the basics of the, the social model is disability is reflective of society. We are bound by the problems of society. And so that then makes things like it was what Kim Jong-il was trying to do significantly more difficult because it's almost an impossibility to escape that element of history and I always quite like whenever I have the excuse to bring up the um, motto of the Durham Miners uh, Association which is quite simply the past we inherit the future we build that is a very wonderful way of sort of understanding that relationship to history particularly when we talk about disability and other minority groups yes there's all these problems why we're not mentioned within history but it's we're now in a position where if we learn from it and see that there are all these examples we can move forward and do something more productive. The third segment I talk about is the lack of aesthetics and so on, which I think sort of a slightly more unique kind of problem because if you, if anyone reads sort of any sort of criticism or any sort of discussion about composers and so on, particularly if you're discussing women composers, particularly the nonsensical question of, oh, they sound feminine, or it sounds like it's a woman composing it, or does this sound like a woman composing it at all? Saying things like Unsuk Chin, she doesn't sound very woman-like at all in her music. And all this very other bits of nonsense, which don't really have that much material basis, but the, the thing is, is what has that, advan that advantage brings is that it's then a material thing to respond to. So how does X relate to this? How does X relate to this and so then when you've then got a situation where we have all these composers we have all these musicians but because we don't have a uh, something to compare them against we have no real idea how to bring all these strands together and which then makes criticism discussion and so on even more difficult because there isn't that sort of understanding and when if we then also make the comparison with say literature Criplet, crip poetry is in a significantly stronger position. There's a wonderful book called Beauty as a Verb, which is this fantastic anthology of uh, crip poetry from, I think it's the past 60 years, maybe, which just shows the evolution, shows how the sort of the relationship these poets had to society in various sort of different instances has changed because one, there's less shame in being disabled, there's much more understanding of themselves and all these various sort of different bits. And it's a wonderful sense of showing that that 
idiom has a wonderful maturity that can it can talk about that manner and you can sort of compare just cripplet against cripplet or crip poetry against crip poetry whereas say this idea of crip music we're not at that position yet which makes it even more difficult to then highlight these things within music academia there have also been some illusions that have come about namely um a book called disability aesthetics by sievers from 2010 and i have a major issues with it in the sense of the essentially they make the comparison between disabled being disabled people being compared to degenerates like with the rest of the unwanted people that but that deemed unwanted by the nazi regime and they then also sort of links how oh there was degenerate art because it was by the serialists it was by people who were deemed too communist and all, all too jewish and various other different bits and the problem with and now essentially the illusion is that because modernists were deemed degenerate disabled people were deemed degenerate boom modernism is degenerate therefore modernism is disabled which doesn't really help ultimately mostly in the sense of the people who've made modernism for the past 100 years there weren't many disabled people in it there were disabled people there there are some figures who are discussed but it's not there and i think the other sort of and key and sort of bigger problem with that kind of discussion as well as it sort of suggests that no matter what disabled people are doing it's a broken equivalent which i would just quite like a slightly more aspirational kind of significance than just this idea that if you then address all these various different problems you could be in a situation where a minority group becomes the best of the thing and then the final sort of segment that i talk about is the just lack of general awareness within musicological environments and so on this all feeds in together into one thing in the sense of if those things don't exist academics don't write about it if academics don't write about it people don't know it exists if people don't know it exists and it just that that loop keeps feeding on and so on um but as i mentioned within the book and i probably waffled earlier as well the if we can sort of make those sort of positive efforts and then we see things like the archive uh frau music which is sort of this wonderful massive archive purely dedicated to women composers if we could then build something like that that would then mean we can then have a very good base to then make sure that academia within music can develop and move forward and so on and that's kind of the big thing those three elements feed into that problem and then if you can then address those three that final problem will eventually fix in some way it's not an easy task but it is something that will happen and then we can just focus on the joys of discrimination and so on and i think particularly for my chapter because of the unique nature that the arts particularly have that it had to spend more time focused on that and allow all the other academics who are significantly more more experienced than i am in that kind of field to talk more about the ex experience problem of it whereas i think that just because of this particular problem that we have within music and within the arts i think it's quite good to have that kind of analytical discussion of what makes it work why does it benefit certain people over others and that's kind of what i hope i bring to this book and to the chapter so thank you very much for listening to my waffle Thank you very much, Ben. Um, and and to be honest, you know, it, I found your chapter particularly interesting because when we're talking about academia, most of us talking about, um, you know, the, the social sciences or arts and humanities as a as a as a broad field or as a STEM subject, but but music or performance or dance are, are often not. I don't know why, but they're often not kind of part of the of the bigger picture and of the bigger conversations. Which is why your contribution is is offering that unique unique element um, and that's that's why it was particularly important for me to have you involved in this so thank you very much um there are a few kind of comments coming in now so thank you very much everybody for commenting um i'm not forgetting you i will be picking up on all of those things i keep making notes as we go through but i would like to um move on on the presentations first so that we can have a, a more sort of looser conversation rather than a, 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 you know just people lecturing if you like um the next speaker is joe sullivan um, who at the time of writing uh, this book was at Chester University but has in, in the meantime moved on to Salford University. So anybody wanting to find out about her, she's at Salford now. <laughs> jo um, is also a qualified adult nurse and registered health visitor and she spent much of her career working with individuals and their families um, in relation to Asperger's syndrome and in her chapter she's specifically looking at 
nurse education and like Ben's chapter was about music and the musicology, Joe's um, view and angle and perspective on new nursing education was particularly unique and is something that, that is not just um, hitting the, the kind of markers for nursing education, it, it, it is something that we can all relate to in all of the disciplines, but it's something that's often marginalised in the kind of the bigger debates. So um, no further ado, Joe, I'm handing over to you. Thank you very much, Nicole. I hope you can all hear me okay. I had a mild technical issue joining, so um, and it's lovely to see so many on the call. I'm just going to attempt to share my screen now. Um, always a bit of a tense moment, but let's go for it. Um, I'm going to just check that. Uh, I don't know what Nicole. Can you see? Yes, yes, you yes. Everything's fine. You've got my slides, yes? Yes, and we've got the, the, the preview on the left as well. So we can see everything. We can see your entire screen. You can see my entire screen in, in a bad way or? No, 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 that was no hint. <laughs> I'm sorry oh, about that. No, no, sorry. no, not in a bad way. <laughs> I've just done a couple of slides just so I could really focus on the, the main points I wanted to raise from the, the chapter I contributed. and. Rather like Ben, this is a huge novelty for me. It's my first sort of book publication and I'm delighted to be asked and delighted to have the opportunity to contribute. Um, so it, my, my angle really is I, I, I'm, I'm not a, an individual with a disability, but my career has been very much around supporting particularly uh, people with autism. And I do wear a number of sort of, I do have a number of lenses I look through. My own son, who's now 25, uh, was diagnosed as a young child with autism and has also gone through a professional degree, not a nursing one, but a professional degree. So that gave me another aspect of the journey, as well as looking at it from a lecturer's point of view, really. And I was very keen and what, what struck me when I joined academia was that we were very heavily recruiting from um, this particular group uh, and it's a very um, universal policy of inclusion now I suspect nationally and it will be uh, around um, inclusion and um, um, actively recruiting from certain um, student bodies but what I became quite alarmed at was what happened when we got them in the door really especially if individuals were undertaking a professional degree, because that's quite a different undergraduate experience to a traditional undergraduate course. I know this because I've got three children, all did different kinds of degrees, but um, it just is a sort of point of interest. So um, I'll just click on, can you see my next slide, Nicole, there as well? So I think one, thanks, Ben. One of the things that I really uh, wanted to talk about in the chapter was that, positionality that people with autism particularly come to us with at university. So we have to realise that if, if people, especially with high functioning autism, and I don't like that term, um, who've been through a mainstream educational system, the, in order to have managed to get to the door of a uni has been quite the journey. And I think as recruiters and um, departments, we need to really recognise that because that already tells us an awful lot about that particular individual, that they've been through a very difficult time during mainstream education and they've managed to find their way to university and be accepted on some of the most competitive courses to get on really in some respects or the more rigorously uh, recruited courses to get on. So that in itself is, uh, is something that we need to really take great, great pride in, I think, really, as organisations and that they've chosen to come to us. And university really gives individuals who may have had very little control over their diagnosis, and I use that word very deliberately as a qualified nurse, um, rather than label or identity, a diagnosis, uh, they may have had through their life very little control over who knew that as children because it might have been disclosed on their behalf to educationalists in the past. When you come to university, um, especially as a young person, it may be that you don't want to start your relationships and journeys from that point. You might want to give people the opportunity to know other things around you besides that. So it gives you the opportunity to sort of 
um, think about how you position your own challenges or identity a little bit more really. And also that sort of look at employability, which professional degrees will give you in nursing degrees, it's virtually 100% employment on a nursing degree at the moment, just because we're so very short of nurses. So that vindication of all the work you've done and all the commitment you've shown through your life, this a degree like this would offer you that vindication really as well. However, that's going to come at a cost for you because any student, this is anecdotal that I speak to who or anybody I work with in academia or indeed in nursing, there is a level of repression around self that has to go on in order for you to be able to conform to the requirements of these courses. And that's something that worries me greatly as, as a lecturer really around well-being questions and also authenticity. I think that's something that we really do need to focus on sort of moving forward really. Um, so on to my next slide. Hope you can see that one okay. Lovely. The problems and the barriers that we put up. So we, we have this very uh, public facing voice of inclusion um, and um, encouragement, which is absolutely correct, because I'm a firm believer that education is such a key to, to life choices. Um, being from a working class background myself and uh, not doing a degree initially, um, I'm very, very passionate about opportunity. And, um, and that's what the message that universities should be giving. And, the, the, you know, moving to um, uh, Salford, which is in a, a very working class area of the northwest of England, uh, they're, they're very hot on that as well, which is really lovely to see. And that's one of the one of the reasons I, I went over there. But we do have, and I suspect this isn't unique to a nursing professional degree, a very values based recruitment process. So, for example, when we're recruiting would be nurses, we're looking at them in group settings as part of that recruitment. We're asking them to perform and um, add to a debate around various issues and topics. And that will be observed by recruiting lecturers to see how they perform. And as anyone who knows anything about autism will know, that's not going to be your environment to shine because you have a social and communication difference that will be judged quite differently. So if your eye contact's different and your use of body language is different, we're not going to infer all kinds of inaccurate information about you from that process. So that worries me a great deal, really. Um, so, and that's very, very heavily touted as part of the NHS recruitment process, values-based uh, recruitment. Then when you enter the degree, it's a different experience again. So we have a thing called a good health, good character declaration. And um, so that we're asking people to disclose any past history that they have. And the question of disclosure is very vexed. So we can't force you to disclose that you have autism. But if, however, at some point in the future, you find yourself inadvertently part of a suitability hearing, because there's been some misdemeanor either out in practice or whilst you've been um, in accommodation and it's had to go to a suitability hearing because you're on a professional degree and you then disclose that you have autism, that's going to go against you. That's going to be seen and perceived as dishonest, which is deeply problematic because that's a choice. It isn't, and your diagnosis is a private matter just like any medical information about myself is a private matter, not to be shared, more or less. There's some things I have to disclose as a nurse. Book. So that for me was a, a, a real question mark in our processing and your constant surveillance. So for all our students who are under, undertaking a nursing study, um, you are, your social media is surveyed, your conduct out of university is is taken into consideration. So if there is some uh, misdemeanor that happens um, and it comes to our attention, we will look at a suitability hearing again for you. And it happens very frequently. And um, so, and if you think about the mistakes that you can make socially and how things can escalate very quickly for you and how you might lose control of that, you can see how someone who's neurodiverse might very easily find themselves in proceedings 
without really it being um, a fault issue or it could just be part of your condition that you've made a judgment call that perhaps wasn't the best. So um, again, an issue. Then you're taught by predominantly ex-nurses. So everyone who nurse lectures or teaches nurses is a registered nurse. My problem, I've been a nurse for 30 odd years now, and from the very day I started, my training and education is steeped in the medical model of disability. I am taught to deficit spot all the time. Uh, I teach it to, I was teaching student nurses this week and my job in the skills lab is to teach them how to spot deficit because that's what the NHS is interested in. What can't you do? So, and as a human being and as a nurse for a long time, it is virtually impossible to, to switch that narrative off in my head. I will sit in a railway station or a cafe and spot someone limping. I will spot children playing and I will immediately start assessing them. It's like a, an affliction really, but you can't switch that off. So even with the lecturer student relationship, Lecturers are dubious about the possibility of this student being successful because they're, they're deficit spotting all the time. And it's very difficult to switch that off, really. The NHS constitution is a very big part of our recruitment as well. So we talk about care and compassion and uh, the six C's it's called, which I won't go into. But that notion of empathy and autism is misunderstood all the time also. So we talk about people with autism not having empathy, which is completely untrue. It may well manifest very differently to how I might manifest empathy, but it exists. Just like in general populations, other people are more empathetic than others. Doesn't mean that this kind of a career is exclusive to you because you have that condition and because of our very poor understanding of what empathy can look like in individuals really. Then when you hit clinical practice, and this is really where my research, is, my research interest lies, is what's happening in those work-based learning environments or clinical environments if you're training to be a nurse or becoming a nurse. What's happening with our colleagues that's stopping you succeed because half of your time, you're gonna be spending with colleagues out in clinical placement for your three years with us. And we have a very, very socially constructed idea of what professional looks like. As a long time nurse, I've worked under multiple settings. And I can tell you that professional in a trauma room in an A&E looks very different to professional in a, a learning disabilities team, looks very different to a multidisciplinary meeting team, looks very different to her consultant um, orthopedic uh, consultant's clinic team. It's a, they're all different, the interactions are different and it is a, an absolute minefield to navigate that even as a neurotypical individual. So to have to do that from a neurodiverse point of view is, is gonna disable you quite quickly. Those environments are gonna be rather muddled for you. So it's very easy for you to fall foul of social etiquette or professional etiquette in those areas. And then finally, what we're looking for when we're assessing students out in, in placements and work-based area is a complete and utter adherence to the status quo. That's what we want. As, as practice educators and mentors, we're looking for someone quite like us, who performs in the way that we would expect them to and doesn't divert from that narrative. We're not looking for anything different really, because we're, it's a very traditional organization with very traditional professional boundaries. So if you're slightly different to that, you're gonna have your work cut out persuading people that you can meet professional value targets in those settings. So what do we do about that finally? So we stop saying and we start doing. For me, it is um, completely unforgivable that universities, and I'm not targeting any particular organization at all here because I suspect this is patchy across the country, but to actively recruit someone on a professional degree of any description with a declared need and then not to support them adequately is wrong. You can't take their money. If you can't do it right, don't recruit them because that's just disingenuous, at least, and unprofessional. 
So we have to start putting our money where our mouths are. And I don't just mean some vague, wishy-washy support. I mean people who genuinely understand the needs of that particular group of individuals and are specialised in it and can do it readily. I don't mean one person for a whole student body either. So get your hands in your pockets and pay the people to do the job. That's what we need. We need to overhaul our recruitment processes so that we are not excluding people who would make fantastic nurses, fantastic people, just because they're not contributing well enough in a group discussion. What a load of rubbish. That makes no, that's no correlation between how you're going to perform in a clinical environment, none at all. So we have to overhaul that really. And it's an opportunity for universities to continue to do the right thing by people who are underrepresented. So we need universities to see the absolute latent talent that individuals have and the complete um, um, promise they can bring to a profession like this. In order to nurse a diverse population of people, we need a diverse workforce to do that. So it's imperative that we recruit people from those, these backgrounds to do the right and the best job by the individuals that we serve as part of the NHS. So that's what my chapter is about. <laughs> um, and um, I hope that made sense, guys. Um, that's kind of all I've got to say. So I am going to stop sharing now. I'm not very familiar with the Zoom. I'm a Teams girl. And uh, it's kind much. of slightly different. Yeah, you've done it. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Joe, for, for your contribution. And I hope um, anyone who's listening in today can actually see how, how what Joe and Ben are talking about, completely different areas of, 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 of disciplines, but actually not so different in terms of what they're talking about, um, in terms of the practicalities of, of, of being disabled, of, of the need of role models and, and the kind of support that we need um, in, in that environment. Um, what I would suggest is I would, as, as there seems to be um, a, a chat happening now in the chat box, um, I, I think it may be a good point now to pick out a couple of questions um, and for, for you or three of you to kind of respond to the, some of the comments that have been made um, in relation to your specific talks as well. Um, so Ben, let me start with you if that's okay. Um, there was a comment there that was talking about um, your use of language. Um, <clears throat> and somebody said, um, I find the language that you use um, a challenge, to, you know, the, the language that you use to describe individual needs. Now, I know that this was not your language. You were talking about how people are describing um, in, in musicology, how they are describing disabled people as cripples or in the Bible as lame, as, you know, and, and obviously all of these words are really hard hitting and difficult to digest. Um, is there any kind of way for you to kind of comment on that? Um, what, what's the situation in, in modern day musicology? Is that something that's still very, very much um, an everyday occurrence or do you see a gentle, at least a gentle shift? So one with language, I'm sort of very much of the opinion that it's if we got rid of the language entirely, we sort of let people off the hook about it more than anything else. I think if we keep words like cripple and all the various other different ones that come with it, retard, all the various differences and understand the historical implications of what those words mean and what they meant for people, namely me being autistic meant I would have been deemed a useless eater, which would have meant all the horrendous things if I was born in Germany or in Austria at the wrong time. And so it's, I think it puts, it's better to sort of point that to everyone else to make sure that we don't forget that part of history because it's very easy to just sort of get it out of sight, out of mind. And so that's why I'm personally quite comfortable using it and just sort of keeping it there because it's more to get everyone else to sort of follow suit with it. In relation to the music academia as a whole, generally these words don't tend to sort of appear very much at all in any real way um so cripplet appears a lot because that is specifically for that field um but just this idea of say cripping music is still a very new idea which is, appears in a few places but most academics don't talk about it in that manner sometimes there's um some little challenges in relation to talking about it namely in relation to talking say about madness when we look say at um opera characters who because of love jilted or something gone horrendous wrong in the plot they 
have a breakdown and sing a six minute aria about it. And so it's then described as they went mad or something along those lines or talking about um, Zemlinsky's Dash Zwerg, which so just they're a dwarf and that's just how it's kind of dis discussed. And so the problems of those kind of language only tends to sort of pop up when it is about a particular topic in relation inside music, but actually most academics, because music is generally quite liberal, they're very yes. eager to not chuck out words that might be offensive, whereas by then come in shouting all, all forms of obscenity just to make people uncomfortable sometimes. Thank you very much. Thank you. And there is actually a comment there saying that the word crib um, is becoming reclaimed by the disabled people. So as, as something as an uh, identifier, as an identity, it's a little bit about um, or similar to the kind of debate around being deaf um, and deaf with a capital D deaf. So um, and that, there's actually a chapter in that book as well that's talking about that difference between hearing impairment, hearing loss deaf with a non-capital D and then the, the big yeah. D deaf. Yeah, so absolutely, I, I totally am with you. Thank you, Ben. Um, Jen, I've got a question for you. Um, you were talking about um, your authenticity and embodiment chapter. One of the things that I was wondering um, is that it, obviously, you know, when we're using embodiment um, and embodied inquiry as a lens to look at it, we're specifically looking at the bodily experiences, but actually the bodily experiences aren't the same all of the time. Um, and, and, and therefore, this is, this is the part that's kind of of interest to me. Um, I was just thinking, well, as, even as, an, as a dis disabled person, you've got a, a normal state, you know, like a baseline. This is in my disabled body. This is my normal. And, and today I don't feel in sync with my normal normal. So, so, so that's what makes me feel a little bit weird and odd. So how does embodied, embodied inquiry kind of try and, and, and work around the fluctuations, if you like? Is there a way of, of capturing um, those fluctuations? Oh, that's such a good question. I think this is why I like using authentic movement as a, a form or as a structure for when I write um, in an embodied way, whether that is autoethnographic type writing or whether I'm writing in memory of something, um, because the form of it is very much just in the present tense. So you're speaking about this moment in time. It's very much like a snapshot rather than trying to generalize over a longer period. Um, and I think you're, you're right, you know, the fluctuations of a disability, of chronic illness, of neurodivergence, of anything, of life can be really difficult to navigate. So all we can do is be authentic and true to who we are in this moment and to recognise that this moment may be different from the previous moment or the moment that went before. And that's why this approach is it's not just about research. It's not just about data. It's also about processing, reflecting on and processing our own experiences to make sense of it. So it's like a hermeneutic spiral. And I know you talk about this quite a lot, Nicole. It's those spirals of making sense and the making sense of the making sense to, to kind of come to an understanding. But it's not about providing an answer that is fit for everybody or even fit for you for all of the time. It's just about looking at what is happening now. And there's a, a question around um, COVID-19 and how that's had an impact. And I think that really has had an impact on a lot of people with disabilities and chronic illnesses on how they negotiate and navigate the world around them and their own experiences with the world around them because it's made some of those barriers much smaller, but also some of them a lot wider and they feel a lot more distant. So for example, around autism and ADHD and masking and not having to interact with people may, may mean that those masks have had to drop and then come back into contact with people can be a lot harder so it's about becoming aware of those moments and noticing them as they are but then not necessarily taking that to mean that that's true all the time thank you very much thank you very much jen joe there's a question here which i'm going to read out hi joe really nice talk and some great points made about how disclosure of autism is still surrounded by ableism how do you navigate as a non-disabled person working in disabled spaces, ensuring that the voices of disabled and, non, um, and neurodivergent people 
are not spoken over or ignored. And in a way that kind of ties in um, with the previous question, which was also asking about, um, do we have comments on the responsibilities of co-creation representation um, regarding dis disabled voices and perspectives um, with this big slogan in mind, simply nothing about us without us. So um, Joe, the, the, these kind of big questions, but yeah, I'm just throwing them at, at you. <laughs> um, so I think <clears throat> it's a, a fantastic question. And certainly since I undertook further study myself in this area, uh, was an area that I completely overlooked about, about uh, I, 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 I as an individual did things on people's behalves really. And um, I think that um, it's, a, it's a question, there's certainly an attempt to do this. And I think it's very linked with disclosure. I suppose we could argue that if you choose to disclose and come to us with a very open disclosure, it puts you uh, as an individual who has neurodiversity in the driving seat of that journey more. Whereas if, if a disclosure comes later or even a diagnosis comes later, we're inevitably going to be um, ca playing catch up a little bit more with planning your journey, I think. So, um, but it's problematic. Yes. So wh why do I need to know that about you really? Um, and I think that's a bigger question that's around our cultural understanding of, of what um, a professional looks like more than anything, really, uh, Nicole. Um, how do we ensure it? Well, I'm, I mean, we, I suppose in universities you have the usual roots of the student voice um, is the student voice is very much valued and enhanced and focused on at the moment organizations like Health Education England that are responsible for all the sort of training requirements for our NHS uh, are very big on that for want of a better description really. So they're always looking to enhance it. My problem with that is you tend to get the same handful of students coming forward for everything and it's not a very diverse panel of people. And I suppose the question for us is how do we make those environments safe and friendly and appropriate enough for people who are neurodivergent to come and speak openly about what their needs are and how they feel about the processes they're going through. So I think it's a very burgeoning area and I like to think that there are a lot and, and in my experience I have peers who are very committed to it but it's an institutional response we need to that rather than an individual lecturer one really. Um, so it's a slow process and it's something that absolutely and it's, all, it's that problem of owning a disability, isn't it, really, as well. My own sons, we did this as parents, I'll admit. We did this all the time when he was a young boy. We took things into our own hands and made decisions on his behalf as parents with a young child. And then as, the, as people are moving towards independence, it's very hard to let go of that control. You know, and I think any parent would probably agree with that, really, because you tend to be a little bit more vulnerable. But then how do, how do you live an adult life and how do you live the life you choose if you're not allowing people to make the decisions they want to make, really? So um, I've no I've no slick answer to that, Nicole, I'm afraid. Thank you very much. I don't think any one of us has, actually. Um, so what I want to do now, really, is I want to um, go back to um, one final presentation that we still have. Um, which is oh, yeah. Um, so I haven't been able to make it for personal circumstances, um, but I've recorded this. I am more than happy for you to get in touch um, either through email or on Twitter about the chapter if you have any questions you want to ask. Um, and yeah, I hope you're enjoying the rest of your day. So what I'm going to talk about is my chapter um, on thinking about making my invisible disability visible, uh, particularly while teaching. And in the chapter, I, I've, I've kind of, I focus on the idea of, of making disability part of my teaching practice. And so I thought I want to kind of reflect a little bit on um, what I wrote and yeah, give you kind of a bit of an overview as well. Um, so I am a disabled person. I have um, an invisible disability or a disability that isn't easily apparent to somebody who doesn't know what they're looking to, to see. Um, 
And when I talk about disability with my students, I make a really deliberate decision to not name my diagnosis because I want to focus on disability as experience and as a socio-political identity and I teach sociology so my students are familiar with the kind of the broad idea around gender sexuality race class age as identity categories as um as as identities that shape how we experience the world and how others see and treat us and in one of the classes I teach now, we actually focus explicitly on disability. But at the time when I wrote this, I, I wasn't teaching um, in a permanent position. So I was teaching wherever I could. And disability wasn't necessarily something that my students were familiar with, but I was working on the idea that they would, they'd be familiar enough with that kind of broad concepts around identity that if I approach disability as another facet of identity they'd be relatively comfortable relatively quickly and so I talk about dis my disability and what it means um, in terms of teaching and in terms therefore of their learning so it's it was a really strategic decision. Um, it was strategic in that it's part of my kind of broader um, political approach to teaching in which I'm resisting compulsory abledness. But it's also about kind of acknowledging that I bring things to my teaching spaces, my students bring things to their learning spaces that impact and are impacted by who they are. So identity and selfhood is a core aspect of teaching and learning for me. So for me to talk about disability um, in, in, in a learning space is, it seems kind of counter not counterintuitive, more counter, um, counter to my principles uh, and my, my approaches. If I don't talk about my own disability, I talk about my own gender, um, I talk about my own race. So why might I not, so, so talk, yeah, talking about myself as though I was dis non-disabled is kind of felt very uncomfortable to me. But it's also, when it boils right down to it, it's about necessity. It's about the things I need in order to be able to do my job. And I make that clear, like that's that's the ultimate bit um, that I kind of try to push to my students is they need to do this thing in order for me to do my things. So yeah, the really kind of the big example I give to them is that they need to submit their essays or whatever their coursework is in a certain type of font in a sansory font and of a certain size so that it is readable to me if it's not readable i can't mark it and therefore i can't do my job i can't give them the grade that they deserve so it's very much thinking about their um their own experience now, in terms of thinking about it as the things I need in order to be able to do my job, we come into the category of what we call, like, what quite often in the, lang in the language around disability in the workplace is quite often called reasonable adjustments. And reasonable adjustments is, is predicated on this idea of reasonable. What is reasonable? And reasonable adjustments quite often can become positioned as unreasonable when they depend on interpersonal interactions behaviors and actions so it's reasonable to ask me to do things in a particular way it's reasonable perhaps for to ask the university to provide particular equipment um, or for, for that to be paid for through access to work but it's unreasonable 
to go in other ways. So asking for adjustments, reasonable or unreasonable, is about that risk management. It's about emotional labor. Um, and it's in particular, it's it's kind of, I can see my, the, the kind of reflection on it of, of, do I ask for these adjustments? Do I ask people to change? Will my adjustments be positioned as unreasonable? Comes in in these three questions. Will this person do as I ask? Will they listen and respond in the way that I want? Let alone will they do so with grace and care? Will asking them be responded to with hostility? Not just in that moment, but ongoing. Am I going to make a mis to, to be responded to host with, with hostility in future interactions after I do this? And will I have to keep asking them? Am I going to have to say, I need you to do this thing? And then a day later, I need you to do this thing. And then three days later, remind them that I need them to do the thing. And three years later, remind them that they need to do the thing. So what, how much energy do I want to spend on this is essentially the question I'm asking. Is it worth it for me in terms of those, that risk management? And is it worth it in terms of the emotional labor that goes into asking for adjustments? And I decided that with my students, yes, there is a value to it. Which is not to say it's not a risk. And I'll come back to that in a bit. But in asking for adjustments, the big risk is that my disability becomes visible. There is a certain degree of benefit to being able to pass as non-disabled. It's not always great. In particular, because it makes asking for these adjustments more challenging because people can't see the reason I'm asking. But on top of that, it means that in positioning myself as disabled, in, in, in claiming that disabled identity, I position myself as the problem because disability is positioned within the academy as a problem. And as Sarah Ahmed points out, in drawing attention to the problem, we become the problem. So in saying that they need to make this adjustment, I become problematic, I become difficult and I become unreasonable. So asking for adjustments is about managing that time in which I become unreasonable. So in making some of the adjustments part of the requirements in you know, in framing them in that space within the kind of introduction to the module, uh, the, the, the first lecture um, and seminar of the term, um, in framing them as next to and sometimes integrated with the kind of this is what you need to do to pass the module um, thing, I, I do mitigate the risk. I do deliberately use the um, the power differential within the relationship between the lecturer and the students um, to mitigate some of that risk. But I also go and make it a part of a conversation. Um, part of thinking about um, access needs as, a, as an act of collective care and of making it about saying to my students, OK, so in order for me, not just in order for me to be able to do my job, but in order for me to be comfortable and happy in this space, I have particular needs and then saying to them, well, what are your needs? What does your what does looking after you look like? So we think about students own adjustments um, and their access needs, whether or not they are identifying or declaring disability. Um, yeah, you know, what? How? How can we make the space of learning and the, the 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 process that they're going through comfortable? Um, we talk about pronouns, um, behaviours, and expectations. 
we talk about particularly about content notes um, for some of the stuff that I teach that might be quite challenging um, or even triggering and how they might think about self care and how important that is. And how they can then you know, in in being challenged and in welcoming that challenge, they can build space for conversation um, and for learning from each other. So it's it's, it's a bit of recognising um, and making explicit that they bring things into the room that are relevant, but they might also have other people bringing things into the room that may unexpectedly impact their learning so it's about how we how we collectively build us that space um, and it sounds very high-minded and ideological but it, it's very much about going okay so we're in this for the next you know three months how are we going to make this as good as possible what do we expect of each other and in that way i am seeking to reposition those unreasonable adjustments as reasonable, as acts of care um, and as acts that they do not just for me, but they do for themselves as well. So to finish off, I'm going to reflect on a little bit about how my circumstances have changed and therefore what that means for what I wrote. In the chapter, I, I do address the fact that at the time of writing, I was precariously employed. I was on a fixed term contract, um, although I was infinitely glad to have a fixed term contract rather than my previous year's experience um, for several years of being hourly paid. So I was both wanting to make sure that I did a really good job so that you know, there might be a possibility that I'd be asked back the next year um, or if nothing else, just given a really good reference. But also wanting to do a good job for myself, for my, you know, for my own lofty, high minded ideals. Um, and that meant that there was a riskiness to asking for reasonable adjustments. It's it's about that that risk the risk factor became in particular about how do my students feel about this? And if they don't feel comfortable with what I'm asking them to do, are they going to complain? And how is that going to impact my employment chances here? So it becomes again it's thinking about that risk and it's throwing and acknowledging those risk factors. Um, and to kind of, if you were thinking of this from more from a line manager um, or a, you know, a, a management perspective, what are the risk factors that you are asking staff to take on um, in these spaces? And then now I am more securely employed. Um, And it does make a difference. I feel more able to make demands of my students in a way and, and to challenge the ways in which they previously have been learning. Because while I'm still concerned about their student, their experience, their, you know, their enjoyment of my teaching, I feel a little bit more secure in, in kind of pushing them a bit further in about making them a little bit uncomfortable. Um, but I also feel more secure and supported um, in terms of who, in terms of management, um, simply because my job is more secure. So from a more from a management perspective, thinking again about what secure employment um, and the kind of the systems of the academy mean for disabled staff in terms of asking for those interpersonal unreasonable adjustments. Thank you very much. Um, have a lovely rest of your day, guys. Bye.
Right. Well, thank you very much, Emma. Um, this was Emma Shepherd, who's unfortunately not here today. But um, as you can see, she's um, her contribution is in, is resonating with many of us. Um, her experience is, is 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 quite similar to to what we are talking about. Um, so um, I'm quite aware of the time. Um, it, it's quite surprising, really, when we were planning this and we were talking about 90 minutes. I thought that um, 90 minutes felt long. Um, I'm now realizing at the end of 90 minutes, it was by far not long enough. Um, so in many ways, um, we've only just kind of scraped the surface of, of what the book is all about. Um, I would strongly recommend everybody to get in touch with the authors um, to share um, the, the book as far as and wide as you can. There are. It, there are genuinely some really, really important contributions. Um, the book covers things like deaf culture, it covers um, blindness, um, collagenous um, colitis, it covers depression, it covers bereavement. Um, there are um, making sense of your um, experiences after major trauma. So it's generally dyslexia, autism, there are so many topics that are being covered. Um, it's just a very, very um, comprehensive com com um, this collection of, of, of contributions. I would like to kind of say thank you very much to everybody who's been here watching and listening, but um, also thank you very much to all of the authors, contributors, and especially the, the panelists today. So Ben, Jen and Joe and Emma, thank you very much for your contributions today. I really appreciate that. Thank you also to Bristol University Press and Policy Press for not only making the book possible, but also for supporting us with this formal launch. Um, I have put some um, links into the chat box. So do check out the YouTube channel um, and, and get in touch. So thank you very much um, for, 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 for everything.